Uh, yes, this uh, talk is called Shouldering the Pain. Uh, my name is David Rudman. Uh, like Colette said, I um, did my medical school at Syracuse. I did my orthopedic residency at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York City, uh, where I had the opportunity to take care of the uh, Jets and the Rangers. I did my orthopedic oncology at Sloan Kettering. Uh, my orthopedic trauma was at U with UT Southwestern in uh, Parkland, Texas. And I joined the Harvard program for six months to do Boston Children's Hospital for Pediatric Orthopedics. I then went on to do a shoulder knee and sports medicine fellowship at the Stephen Hawkins Clinic in Denver, Colorado, as uh, Colette mentioned. And there I was with the Broncos and the Rockies for a year. It was, uh, it was wonderful. <clears throat> My practice is located in uh, Ridgewood. It's uh, Specialty Orthopedics of New Jersey. For those of you who are familiar with the area, it's the old McHugh's building as pictured on the left. Uh, and I do most of my surgeries at a uh, surgery center and at the Valley Hospital in Bridgewood. Uh, I do have a lot of social media and it would be great if you uh, have more questions or, or looking for more information. Uh, it's uh, Specialty Orthopedics in New Jersey on Facebook, at NJ Sports Doc on um, Instagram, uh, David Rudman and LinkedIn. And of course, you can always go to the website at specialtyortho.org. Uh, today, we are gonna talk about um, the shoulder anatomy. We're going to go over common causes of shoulder pain, uh, some of the uh, treatments for these common uh, causes, as well as prevention, uh, and then we will have a time for uh, questions uh, toward the end. So the shoulder joint, and this is actually my favorite model from the office, uh, the shoulder joint is made up of, of three uh, bones. And if you're looking at me, your shoulders, it's like this, okay? The bone in front is your clavicle, the wing bone in back is your scapula, and this is your arm, your humerus. There's two joints that make up the shoulder joint. This one on top, with your clavicle and the chromium, is your AC joint. This joint, the glenoid here, is almost flat like a plate. The humerus is round like a ball. That gives the shoulder the most motion of any joint in the body, but it's not very stable. I don't think you can see, I, you can see the picture on the screen, but I'm unable to point it out. Because it's, uh, you, you, if you look in the bottom right of the picture, you'll see it's almost like a golf ball sitting on a tee. And it's sort of balanced there. In order to make it more stable, the body builds a cushion around the glenoid. That cushion is called a labrum, all right? And if you, on the picture on the right of, of uh, the slide, you can see the white. That white is the articular cartilage. And then around that, you see like a rim. That's the labrum. Coming off the top of that, sort of almost at the 12 o'clock position, is a long noodle looking thing. That's the long head of the biceps. Biceps means two, obviously, because there's one head that comes like this and goes down this groove, and the other head that comes from here and they meet up over here, and then they connect down on your radius. The shoulder, because it's not stable, has some things to make it stable. And one of those things is, is the rotator cuff muscles. I, hear, I still hear a lot that, you know, my cuff is injured, my cuff is injured. It's not a rotator cuff, it's a cuff. So it's made up of four muscles, all right? There's, there's two on the top, all right? Those are called the infraspinatus and supraspinatus. There's one in the back that's called the teres minor. And then there's one in the front, which is the subscapularis. And you can see those uh, depicted here. The picture on the right is looking at it from the front. And the picture on the, I'm sorry, on the, on the left is looking at it from the front on the right is uh, looking at it from the back. There also are some, uh, several other accessory muscles, the biggest of which is the trapezius and the deltoid. And they're real big powerhouses of the, uh, of the shoulder. What I've been seeing a lot more lately is if you look uh, on my slide on the right where the trapezius and the deltoid are, are removed, you can see the muscles on the inside of the uh, scapula. The ones in the top there, I see a lot of pain. People come in now and I think it's from Using people are home using a lot of keyboards, people are always on their phones like this. So, this muscle that connects your scapula up into your neck, the levator scapulae muscle, is getting really, really um, uh, injured. People have a lot of pain, sort of right here, uh, and they can it gets sort of knots in that area. Another way to evaluate the anatomy is with uh, radiographs. And uh, the picture I wish I knew which way you guys were looking at be able to see this, but I'm assuming you look at just what I'm looking at. So on the left side is a picture of the shoulder from the front on an x-ray. And you can see a nice round ball. You see the glenoid and you see uh, the, the clavicle. In the bottom right, you see a picture of what's called an axillary view. 
And in between the ball and the socket, you can see that there's a space. That space is not air, it's filled with cartilage, which is the, on the end of each of the bones. When that's disrupted, that's arthritis, and we're gonna to get to that. The picture on the top right is just showing one of the bones that we, that we evaluate is the acromion, okay? And this is looking at, your, at the uh, shoulder from the side. This acromion here, if it's flat, we grade it as a one. If it's rounded, it's a two, and if it's hooked, it's a three. That's important because sometimes the rotator cuff muscles, which come in through that groove, like my fingers are now, they can be pinched up against that. And if it's a three, you have a higher likelihood of having some injuries uh, in that, in, to the rotator cuff. So what are some causes of, uh, common causes of shoulder pain? Uh, fracture could be a, a big cause of shoulder pain and any one of these three bones can be fractured. I see a lot of fractures of the clavicle, not all of which require uh, surgery. I see that more often in, uh, with trauma and contact sports, uh, as well as cycling injuries. Uh, I treat a lot of triathlons, triathletes, uh, and uh, unfortunately, when you go over the head of the bike, uh, the way you land is usually uh, you can suffer uh, AC separations or fractures of your uh, clavicle. What's a dislocation? Well, remember I mentioned before that the glenohumeral joint is like a socket and a ball. When that dislocates, when the ball comes out of the socket, that's called a dislocation. If you have that, if you're in, in young patients, when, they, when, they, when the ball comes out of the socket, they tear the labrum, which is that gasket that I was talking about. That, 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 and it comes out and you tear the labrum and often that needs to be fixed orthoscopically. When, you, when, when, when you're older, sort of over 45, 50, uh, when you come out, you, tear, you often tear your rotator cuff. That's because that becomes the weak link in the, uh, in the system. A shoulder separation doesn't have to do with the glenohumeral joint, it has to do with the acromioclavicular joint. So when that gets injured, uh, it can be grade one, which is when it's just like, it stay, the, the bones stay right here, the ligaments around the capsule get injured. And then we grade it up to a five when it goes up to here and a six is when it goes underneath. But that's the AC separations. Also other things that can generate pain such as the labrum and the biceps. And the biceps has been a, a, a little bit controversial, but it's definitely a pain generator. And then very, very common that we talk a lot about the rotator cuff, and we'll, we'll go more in depth about that. And then about uh, arthritic changes, both in the AC joint and the glenohumeral joint as causing um, shoulder pain. When we discuss shoulder pain, we can't neglect talking about your neck, cervical pathology, okay, or your cervical spine, because there's a lot of overlap. All of the nerves that come out of your neck that come down to your brachial plexus and that spread out to you to all the way to the end of your fingertips all come from your spine. So there's a lot of overlap between neck and shoulder pathology. So often when you come in for an exam, you have a neck exam as well, because we need to make sure that where, where your shoulder pain is coming from. Is it coming from your neck? or is it coming from your shoulder? So one way to help uh, to, to, to I organize this talk is really talk about what it would be like to come to the office. You're having shoulder pain and, and you know, it's not getting better and you're getting frustrated, so you want to come see a doctor. Well, the doctor's going to ask you a bunch of questions, right? And you're going to fill out paperwork about, about what's bothering you. I'm going to ask you about the location. Where is the pain? How the pain start? Was there trauma or does it just happen sort of, uh, you know, one day you notice, well, you have a little bit of shoulder pain that kind of got worse. Was there an event where you shut a car, you know, shut a car door or lifted up something heavy to put it into a cabinet and you had pain? How long have you been having the pain? When you get it, how long does it last? What makes it worse? Very common with rotator cuff pathology makes it worse with reaching up overhead or uh, putting on a jacket, doing, put, trying to do your bra in the back. Um, and then alleviating things, like what makes it better? Does rest make it better? Uh, does ice make it better? Have you tried an anti-inflammatory? What sort of treatments have you had so far? These, all of these answers give us clues, doctor's clues on what's the cause of the, uh, of the pain and what, I, what, what can I do to help you alleviate that pain? You'll also have a physical exam. Often uh, my uh, male patients will uh, take off their shirts and female patients have a uh, tube top that, that we give them. The idea is I need to be able to look at your shoulder. I need to be able to look at your shoulder blades. 
So we look for uh, bruising and swelling. We look for any asymmetry from one shoulder to the other. Sometimes pain can be generated just from the fact that your scapula, your shoulder blades aren't moving together. That's called scapular dyskinesia. So all of that needs to be evaluated on an exam. We also do uh, palpation. So I can push on your AC joint. If you have arthritis in that AC joint, which is on the top of your shoulder here, it can hurt when I push on it. It'll hurt with cross body adduction. It'll hurt uh, sometimes with what we call active compression tests. And again, th these are different tools that we use to figure out what's generating your pain. We can palpate the greater tuberosity. That is where your rotator cuff uh, inserts. The biceps tendon can also be tender, and that's also often in the front and also in the posterior capsule. Sometimes that bothers you with posterior labral tears. Or uh, if you have uh, arthritis, often we feel that in the back. There are, we always check uh, range of motion. Again, one of the benefits of being an orthopedic surgeon is we check from the side to side differences. So uh, the range of motion, sometimes patients come in, they have shoulder pain for a long time, they're not sure why, uh, and, and they go like this. One arm goes up high and one doesn't. And then we check, we check all external rotation, internal rotation, and they're losing that too. That's often called frozen shoulder or arthrofibrosis. That's more common in patients that have uh, diabetic or thyroid problems, but it can happen to anybody. Sometimes it's related to a little bit of trauma or you just kind of, we have a little trauma and you stop moving your shoulder. And sometimes it's related to real trauma, but sometimes it just happens, it's idiopathic. When you have frozen shoulder, unfortunately that can take a long time to get better. It can take 12 to 18 months, up to two years in patients that have diabetes. Sometimes it gets better on its own. Uh, normally you lose motion and, you're, and you have pain and then the pain, it starts to thaw out. The pain goes away and the motion comes back. It doesn't always come fully back. Sometimes physical therapy can help and sometimes cortisone injections can help. Occasionally we have to do further imaging studies and occasionally we have to do surgery for that. Or I go in surgically and I can release the capsule and, and, and release the tight tissue and then manipulate your arm to get you full motion. We also, we also do strength testing. Often when you have a rotator cuff tear or rotator cuff pathology, those tests may be abnormal. You may be weaker. And we grade that, we grade that muscle strength. And we also compare it to the other side. It doesn't always mean that it's torn if it's weak because you can have an injury to it. And just because you're having pain, you may not be giving full effort because it hurts. And there are also special tests. And here's an example of a bunch of special tests that we do. The Nears and Hawkins test are very common. The liftoff test. This all helps us, again, figure out, I'll make sure I'm not muted. Oh, figure out um, what's the cause of your, your, your specific pain. Here's an example, again, of the same radiographs that I showed before. One of the ways radiographs are helpful is sometimes we can see, like I mentioned before, the acromion, whether it's hooked down, we can also see if there's arthritic changes. And if we have time in the talk, I'll show you pictures of all patients that have arthritis and how that was treated. Uh, but also it can show you things that are calcified. And one of the things that's a little bit more common in New Jersey is calcific tendonitis. Now, when your uh, rotator cuff comes in, and I have different pictures of this too, but your rotator cuff comes in like my finger and it comes underneath the acromion. In between that rotator cuff muscle and the acromion is a fluid filled sac called the bursa. Sometimes we get calcifications just over the rotator cuff, and that can be calcific tendonitis, and that can be severely painful. Actually, some patients go to the emergency room because they're concerned that they actually have an infection or why they have so much pain. They can't, just can't lift up their arm. Sometimes they come in and it looks like they have an infection. Their shoulder's red and hot uh, and swollen, and that can be from calcific tendonitis, and we would see that on x-rays. Now, this x-ray, the one that's on the uh, right side, uh, you, you would see calcifications there and that can tip you off. Sometimes all you need for that is a cortisone injection and that can resolve it. Sometimes you need more than one cortisone injection. Occasionally we need to get further imaging studies to see what the rotator cuff looks like and how much calcification you actually have. And again, occasionally it requires surgery to go in arthroscopically, remove the calcification, remove the bursa and flatten out that, that bent to chromium if it's bent. That's called the decompression. So here's the picture I was talking about. So rotator cuff syndrome, bursitis, impingement, those all mean the same thing. It's often patients come in, they complain that, listen, every time I go, ow, lift up my arm, ow, it hurts. 
or when I go again, putting on a jacket, uh, reaching for something in the back seat. Those things, you know, doing your bra, those things are all sort of clues that the rotator cuff is the problem. If you look at the picture in the, um, on the right side of my screen, you can see the, that fluid filled sac bursa and they show you one with impingement, which is where it's being squeezed. The bursa is not actually a bag like that. It was just easy for us to describe it like that, but it is a space in there and, and it can get inflamed and it can actually be a bag. You, sometimes we see it the most in the elbow. You ever saw somebody that had like a big swollen elbow here? That's an olecranon bursa. And sometimes that needs to be taken out too. And then the, the end stage of this can be a rotator cuff tear. And uh, we'll review that. So if you come to the doctor and you've been evaluated, and all your, all your symptoms, you have a positive Nears, positive Hawkins, and you're having rotator cuff syndrome. The first treatment modalities are things that decrease your inflammation. I recommend ice 20 minutes at a time, two or three times a day. Uh, I like an, an anti-inflammatory. I recommend a leave because uh, a leave is only twice a day. You take it once for breakfast, once for dinner. Uh, you got to take it with food because it can affect your stomach, um, but it's very effective. Activity restrictions. Currently, I have a lot of patients that are playing like indoor tennis or paddle. Uh, I, had, you know, I had a girl uh, today who um, was throwing a soccer ball. She's a soccer goalie. She was repetitively doing this, and she inflamed her uh, biceps and her rotator cuff. So you have to limit the activities uh, that are causing the problem. Sometimes that's too much tennis. Sometimes it's not overuse. Sometimes it's just that you, you, you have this impingement from your daily activities, and we need to rest. So... You have to be willing to modify some of those activities. I have a lot of swimmers now too that, that are coming in with rotator cuff um, uh, problems. And physical therapy can help. Uh, part of the, what physical therapy does is it can increase the strength of the rotator cuff muscles. So as we're decreasing the uh, uh, inflammation, we can also increase the strength, which will pull the ball back into the socket. Again, increasing space for that, for, for your um, uh, rotator cuff. Depending on why you're going to physical therapy can depend on uh, what the therapy is. So sometimes we work on motion, which you see in the, the woman who's giving, getting her shoulders stretched out on the top. Uh, we work on internal and external rotation exercises, scapular stabilizer program. Uh, these exercises are not only beneficial in treating some of these problems, but they're beneficial in preventing them. So I have patients who, you know, maybe, maybe you swim a lot or maybe you do a lot of gardening. Um, or maybe you don't do any of those things, but your shoulder bothers you. But one of the things you can do is start a shoulder uh, uh, strengthening program. And there's three basic exercises that I really like that help. And you can do these at home. You can get a simple rubber band or uh, go to the gym. Uh, this is, I, I think this will work. Uh, this is a rubber band that, that, that I use. One of the exercises is internal rotation, where you just simply pull in like this. Another one is external rotation. When you pull it out to the side. And then the third one is you take both straps. This is the fire around the door. You pull your elbows back, push your chest forward, and hold it. One, two, three, relax. Those are the series of three exercises that I really like. But again, that's for some gentle shoulder strengthening. I often have some patients who I'm going to get back to activity restrictions who are big weightlifters or do a lot of push ups or do a lot of yoga handstands. Uh, sometimes you have to modify those, those activities because they aren't always good for your shoulder. So if you have rotator cuff syndrome uh, and, you, and, you, and you come back in and you say, listen, you know, I, I, I did what you said. I, I did the activity restrictions, the, the ice, the anti-inflammatories. I did some of the uh, home exercises and physical therapy and it's still bothering me. So what's next? You come back in for a repeat history and physical exam. Again, having serial physical exams helps me figure out what the cause of your problem is. And we can move on to the next phase, which can be a cortisone injection. Uh, cortisone is a very strong anti-inflammatory. Um, this is an example of giving cortisone in a subacromial space. That is under the deltoid, under the acromion. So if you look, that's in this space, that's over the rotator cuff, sort of into that bursa. Very helpful for rotator cuff syndrome, calcific tendonitis sometimes even for arthrofibrosis. Uh, if you look uh, below the big blue sac, you see the, uh, one of the heads of the bicep, because you can see both heads. One of the heads uh, has a, a blue sac around it. Uh, that head is, the, that's called the long head of the biceps. That can also be inflamed in another area that we can inject 
uh, both for diagnostic purposes, meaning figuring out where the pain is generated from, but also therapeutic because it can help alleviate your, uh, your, your symptoms. The uh, cortisone, uh, like I said, is a powerful anti-inflammatory. It works on different phases of the inflammatory uh, reaction. Uh, and so do non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which are the NSAIDs you see in this uh, pathway as well. If it's still bothering you, sometimes you require uh, further imaging studies, uh, such as an MRI or ultrasound uh, or CT arthrogram. Right now in my practice, it's most common to get an MRI. It gives me a lot of information about the uh, rotator cuff, uh, as well as uh, the uh, cartilage. The, uh, on the right, you will see a picture of a, an MRI. Uh, there's the uh, sort of diagram of it uh, showing that the rotator cuff is torn. It should be uh, the cartilage cap. Well, you see where the arrow is on the right, on the, that white spot, that shouldn't be filled with fluid. That should be, the rotator cuff should be up against that. And I'll show you an example of a case of that in just a second. So this is a patient that had an MRI. This MRI is looking at you from the front. Again, an MRI is a bunch of uh, slices. It uses a magnet, not radiation. And if you look, the ball is not fully covered. You can see there's a black thing that goes over the top of the ball like this. And instead of being attached here, it's pulled off. Instead of being attached like that, it's pulled off. That's a rotator cuff tear. So what are the options when you have a rotator cuff tear? Well, there's plenty of people walking around with rotator cuff tears now and don't even know. Uh, that increases with age. So somewhere around 80% of people over 80 have a rotator cuff tear. Doesn't mean they all have shoulder pain. Doesn't mean they all need surgery or injections, but it means that it's, that it's there. So it does increase with age. You could do observation. You can continue ice and anti-inflammatories as long as you're able to do the things you want to do. Unfortunately, the natural history with rotator cuff tears is that they don't heal on their own. They often only get larger over time. And sometimes it could be something as simple as, as I mentioned before, shutting a car door or putting on a shirt. And all of a sudden you, you make a small tear into a bigger tear and that can be uh, painful. You could do more physical therapy. You can try another cortisone injection. Uh, there are things called uh, platelet-rich plasma or PRP. Uh, it's a big topic now, as well as uh, progenitor cells, uh, incorrectly called uh, stem cells. Uh, but stem cells seems to be the uh, sort of buzzword now. Uh, what PRP is, we, we take your own blood, we spin it down in a centrifuge, and we give you specific parts of that back uh, that to help uh, healing. There are some studies that show that that helps in certain parts of the body. Um, it's about a coin toss in the uh, shoulder joint. So if you do not respond to conservative management or if you're young and athletic and need your uh, rotator cuff for many, many years, uh, there are, are options to fixing this. Um, some people still do open surgery. Um, I haven't seen that in a long time. Uh, there are several doctors that still do mini opens. Uh, a mini open rotator cuff repair is the majority of, the, of it is done arthroscopically, um, but they, they do split the deltoid and uh, fix your rotator cuff. Uh, in my hands, it's done with arthroscopic surgery where I make three or four small incisions about your shoulder uh, and uh, I use a camera and, a, and special tools and I'm able to uh, take the rotator cuff that's torn off the ball. I put anchors in here and stitches and I sew it back down. And I will show you pictures of that now. This is, uh, uh, looking at, I'm in the subacromial space. So I'm right in here. I'm looking down at the rotator cuff and you see there's a tear right here. That's an example of the tear. The white stuff on the bottom is the uh, articular cartilage. The white stuff on the top is the rotator cuff tear. Uh, this is looking at it from a different view. If you look on the bottom of this uh, arthroscopic picture, this is a uh, right shoulder looking at it from the back. The part that's where it's white and shiny is the articular cartilage, but then you see it gets rough. That's the greater tuberosity. We shouldn't see that. That's where the rotator cuff should be attached to. So what I do is I clean up that greater tuberosity. I clean up the free ends of the torn end of the rotator cuff, and then I repair it. These pictures on the right are the same exact picture. The one on the bottom is it repaired. The one on the top is, it, is uh, the tear. So this is again, just looking again, again, the one on the top is torn. The one on the bottom is repaired. This is an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair, knotless, because there's no, uh, I don't have to tie any knots. 
And this is the same MRI, uh, and you can uh, see the MRI on the left of these pictures uh, that uh, goes along with this uh, rotator cuff tear. With rotator cuff tears, uh, uh, there is a lot of rehabilitation. So um, depending on the size of the tear will depend on how long you're in a sling. Usually it's about six weeks. Often you have to wear, you use a pillow, an abduction pillow that helps keep your arm out to the side. That gives your uh, rotator cuff um, more time to heal because it gives it more blood supply. There's different phases of the rotator cuff uh, uh, protocol. Phase one is maximum protection. That's zero to six weeks. Usually you're in a sling for that time, but the, after the first week, we do elbow, wrist, and hand exercises, often start uh, a pendulum program. After three weeks, we get into formal physical therapy. Uh, again, these are generalizations. Not everybody uh, can follow the same uh, protocol. We work on range of motion first, which is really what we do for the first uh, 12 weeks. Uh, and then we really start around uh, eight to 10 weeks, we can start some gentle isometric strengthening. Uh, at 12 weeks, we increase the uh, strengthening. We start um, uh, uh, plyometrics as you reach the next step. And somewhere around five to six months are back to uh, sports specific activities. Usually, for example, with golf, it's about four or five months before you're chipping and putting, um, similar to uh, tennis. Uh, contact sports are usually around six to seven months. Uh, and uh, patients often feel that it takes it like another month or two to get back before they really feel uh, uh, confident. We do consider uh, soccer a little bit of a contact sport, specifically in the older patients that are having rotator cuff repairs. So I'm going to talk briefly about, we, we did talk about calcific tendonitis, rotator cuff syndrome, uh, arthrofibrosis, frozen shoulder, and uh, rotator cuff tears. But I'm going to briefly talk, uh, I don't want to go over my a lot of time, but I want to briefly talk about arthritis. I don't know if anybody, um, the truth is I can't see if anybody's even participating. So uh, uh, some of you may have been to the talk I gave in December about uh, arthritis. Uh, these are some slides from that. Uh, but arthritis is a, a, a big pain generator, uh, and I see a lot in my practice. Uh, usually patients over 45, some patients under 45 who are heavy laborers, uh, but shoulder arthritis is, if, if you look on the end of like a chicken wing or turkey leg, it's the, you see the articular cartilage, which is really shiny and white and smooth, but when that gets disrupted, that's what arthritis is, okay? There are about 100 different types of arthritis. Um, the most common of which is called osteoarthritis. Uh, and uh, that's what, what, I, what I'll, I'll talk briefly about. Dr. Redman, you, you have about five more minutes. Okay, I'm gonna, okay. Start, I'm gonna go quickly with the arthritis part. Um, the osteoarthritis is what I was talking about, sort of overuse. It's very common. It can be in both the, either the, the AC joint on top or the glenohumeral joint. Um, I bring up rotator cuff arthropathy that's because if you do not have a functioning rotator cuff, or if you are um, uh, older, more senior, um, the, there are prosthesis or ways to fix your arthritis uh, without having to worry if your rotator cuff is intact. Uh, there's different types of cartilage. This is an example of what cartilage actually looks like because this is a cadaveric study. Um, cartilage helps uh, shape and support the uh, structures of the joint. It's a cushioning. Uh, it's really has a low coefficient of friction, so it's very smooth. Uh, as we, this is an example of what it looks like under the uh, microscope. As we age, we dry up and shrivel up. That happens all over our body, and it's, it's not. And cartilage is no no different. So uh, we have less water, and the cartilage gets worn away. Same sort of uh, exam when you go to the doctor. You're going to see the history and physical exam, range of motion. I, I want to show you this x-ray just to contrast what a, uh, the normal one looked like before. You saw that there was a space in between the bones. In this one, you see there's no space. There's, the bones are a little wider. Even in, the ball is no longer round. And you can see on the middle one, you see what we call a goat's beard, which is a, an osteophyte on the bottom of that um, uh, humerus. With arthritis, we do similar things like decreasing inflammation uh, with activity restrictions, physical therapy. In this case, it's really more to try to increase a little bit of the strength, but really to increase the motion because people who have arthritis usually get a little tighter. We use different things to decrease um, we anti-inflammatories such as the leave, but can also use uh, things like uh, uh, Mobic, uh, also Voltaren, it's a diclofenac gel. 
Arthritis is a huge billion dollar business. There are supplements for everything. Again, these are supplements. These are not FDA approved. Uh, again, it's a little more than a flip of a coin of what patients help, uh, what, what it helps patients. Where did my fellowship? We did a study of 100 of these. Only five of them had in it what they said they had in it. Um, Osteobiflex was one of the ones that had in it what it said it had in it. You can do cortisone, visco supplementation, platelet-rich plasma or the progenitor cells, or like I mentioned. Um, we talked about there, there's things called visco supplementation, which is a little bit more effective in the knee. Uh, Synvisc and Hyalgan are those examples. Sometimes shoulder arthroscopy can help, although this is not, not very common. Uh, and this is an example of what happens when every all else fails. Uh, this is an anatomic total shoulder, which is, and I'm almost done, Clet, uh, where you uh, replace the socket with a socket and a ball with a ball. Uh, you need a functioning rotator cuff to do that. Uh, the one on the other side, which we, we take the socket, we make it the ball. We take the ball, we make it a socket. That's called a reverse total shoulder. You do not need a rotator cuff uh, uh, to function to do that. Um, I'm just going to go through real quick. This is an example of a patient that had bad arthritis. This is an MRI. He underwent surgery. We do a lot of things to avoid infection at surgery. At three years, these are his x-ray at three years. Again, you can see the before and after. Uh, at three years, he's catching big fish, doing what he wants to do and can lift his arm up. He can only lift it about 20 degrees preoperatively. Uh, the reverse, again, this is an example of a patient preoperatively. Uh, he couldn't lift up his arm. He had a reverse shoulder replacement. The benefit of the reverse also is that there's very little uh, rehab. It's really you're in a sling for four weeks. This is him after, one year after. He has uh, excellent range of motion and no pain. He's very pleased. That's him moving his arm up. These are uh, the examples of currently. This was, these are two from last month. Uh, the prosthesis just got uh, updated a little bit. It's a little smaller. It's a little bone preservation. Um, but, but it's the same concept of, of replacing uh, both the uh, ball and socket, depending on how we uh, replace those. Sometimes uh, this can help with fractures as well. This is an example of a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty for a uh, uh, fracture. In conclusion, I know we went over, I'm sorry, I'm speaking so fast, but I went over uh, a lot of different ailments of what can cause uh, shoulder pain, uh, both non-operative and operative management for some of those things, uh, as well as prevention being some of the physical therapy that I mentioned uh, and being smart about what you do and do not do. I want to just make, make one more point about prevention because uh, there, there are several patients who come in and the truth is they're doing things that they probably shouldn't be doing anymore. And I know that that's tough to admit. Uh, it was tough for me to admit, and I'm, and I'm not even 50, uh, but we're not 25 anymore. We're not 30, we're not 35. And there's things that we should leave to other people to do, specifically household activities. Uh, so again, please, uh, if you're interested, uh, follow me and like me on Facebook, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn. I also have a YouTube channel. Uh, these are my kids, and that's my dog. All right, Colette. Uh, okay, we'll thank you, Dr. Redman. I have a few questions. Please. Um, the Voltaren box I have does not indicate its use on the shoulder. It indicates hand, wrist, elbow, foot, ankle, and knee. Can it be used on the shoulder? So... Let me, the short answer is yes. The, I'm going to try to stop sharing if I can. Uh, stop sharing. Didn't work. Collect, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so I'm just going to keep speaking. So uh, the answer is um, they, to get FDA approved, you have to study, do studies. It's, they're very, very expensive and you have to do it on certain, certain specific joints and certain specific areas. Um, the answer is yes, that's what the label says. I've had, uh, so, so maybe it's an off-label use, but I've had significant success with it. So I've had a lot of patients who really benefit from uh, Voltaren gel, both in the knee and the shoulder. Okay, thank you. Okay, another question is, she had a, this woman had a partial tear on her right rotator cuff. After several months of PT, the pain diminished and she regained range of motion. What can I do to prevent a relapse or dip further damage? So, I did mention that there, there are partial, a lot of people have partial rotator cuff tears and they never know it. So things to do is just, is just overall general shoulder health. Uh, basically those internal and external rotation exercises and scapular stabilizer three program that I was talking about, 
Uh, I would avoid military press, anything that's like this, because it's not good for your shoulder and it's bad for your bicep. Um, and it, so overall general Thank shoulder health, um, you, you can't be, I tell patients all the time. I tried to go back. You want to do certain activities. So um, you got you to gotta do those. And, I, and, and my job is to help you and, and help you understand the risks, but also get you back to doing the things you want to do. And then that's what, that's what I enjoy doing. So I would tell her to do the activity she wants to do, um, understand that it can happen, but, but do the best you can to prevent it by not doing overuse and by doing your shoulder health exercise program. Does swimming help? Is that a so, good exercise? So swimming is very good. But again, I did mention that I have a lot of patients now that are overdoing it um, because now it's, because it's a great time to be swimming. Uh, it's indoors. Um, but yes, I, I, I actually really love swimming. I think it's great full body exercise. Um, you would like to be uh, doing it the right way. Uh, but yes, swimming can help strengthen your rotator cuff. Okay. Um, I had a rotator cuff surgery five years ago. I have super neck pain. Could that be from the surgery from five years ago? That's not, I, I can't answer yeah. that question. Yeah, okay. Um, she, this woman is a side sleeper. I get shoulder pain and flip at night. Could that be arthritis? So it could be arthritis, but it could also be rotator cuff issues. You know, it's it's very hard to change your sleeping pattern. I get plenty of patients tell me they sleep on their stomachs or with their hands over their heads. Um, it's really hard to change that, um, but it's not an ideal way to sleep, especially because um, when you're like this, that's that that's the point I was talking about where if your fingers in here, right, as my rotator cuff, and I put my hand up, I'm squeezing my finger, right, against the acromion, and that and that's not a good way to sleep. For, the, for your shoulder, so it's not ideal. Um, some, a few people had asked if you could um, show them those three exercises again. Yeah, so, so you can also, this stuff is all over uh, the internet. I'm, I'm gonna make a point of this. 85% of what's on the internet is to try to sell you something. So when you're reading information, it's better to, best to be at either the doctor's website or uh, like the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons so mine's specialtyortho.org or the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons has great information. There's also links to that on my website. So the, the three exercises that I like, this is a rubber band I just brought from the office. I usually give patients a rubber band. The first one is internal rotation. So you, you, you keep your elbow inside, you pull in. Right? You, I usually recommend three sets of 10. The other exercise is external rotation. So that's pulling out. And I'm sorry my back's to you, but what you do is, maybe I'll do it this way. It, it, it's this, it's doing this. You start with it in hand in and you pull out. One, two, three. I recommend you breathe out on the way out when you're um, exerting. So it's. And then the last one is you grab both sides of the rubber band. Equally, you pull your elbows back, you squeeze your shoulder blades together, and you're squeezing your rhomboids. One, two, three, relax. One, two, three, relax. Those are my favorite. Okay, we have one last question. Could you explain briefly calcification and tendonitis? Yeah, so I did mention that calci calcific tendonitis is very common around here. Where I did my fellowship, uh, it was, I, almost, I almost, didn't barely sore. I was in Colorado. Um, so we don't exactly know why, maybe, it's, you know, it's a water it's a geographic, we don't know, but calcific tendonitis is, your rotator cuff comes in like this, right? And, 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 and there's two, one in the front, one in the back. That calcification can either be up in the bursa or literally on the rotator cuff. When it's, if it's in the bursa and it's covered up, there's no pain. It's just there. We see it on x-ray, it's no problem. The, uh, the problem happens when it gets exposed. And then you get this big inflammatory reaction. So for some people, it's really, really painful. Um, and, and, it, and it can get better on its own. And often it does. It can be sped up with cortisone, uh, anti-inflammatories, icing protocol. Um, the, all of those things can help. Occasionally, if it's still bothering you and you tried cortisone, an injection, and it didn't work, or only worked briefly, we get an MRI because I need to see if your rotator cuff is torn. Because often if you have a cuff tear and the calcification, unlikely it's going to get better. Uh, so 
we then have to kind of go in. You can have another repeat cortisone injection, but you can't have too many. Uh, and if that fails, then we go in and I take the calcification out with a uh, arthroscopically with a burr, uh, with a shaver. So the, uh, that can reoccur. Um, and some patients who get better with cortisone come back a couple years later and they have it in the other shoulder or and it happens again. But we're not exactly sure of the cause. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Redmond, for your informative presentation this evening. At this time, 